you're probably familiar with this scene. It's a scene not just synonymous with Call of Duty, but with military shooters in general. It created a trend in shooters that is seen years after the fact, and is still being felt by its influence. The nuke scene in Call of Duty 4 is one of the most shocking and important moments in the franchise, to the point where it has become the inspiration for disturbing scenes in war games going forward. At this point, Military shooters, especially Call of Duty, was no stranger to showing the horrors of war, as Call of Duty 1 through 3 were World War II shooters, and there were several instances of landing the Normandy and depictions of D-Day. But the thing that was constant with those games is that the player was always triumphant. Despite everything, your soldier went through hell and made it out alive, and in some cases even came out a hero in the end. But Call of Duty 4 was a very different game at the time. While Infinity Ward was stuck doing World War II shooter one after another, they noticed that general audiences were more interested in looking to the future. A future where you're playing a heavily armored sci-fi soldier taking down alien threats. Now clearly they didn't want to just copy Halo, because Call of Duty has always been known for being a grounded military shooter. But they still decided to change the game up a little bit taking place in the present day, a modern war. While not foreign to the COD franchise, the swap perspectives was done in an expert way in this game, as it showed the vast difference between the British Special Forces and the US Marines. The SAS missions were methodic and tactical, while the Marines were aggressive and pushed forward with their might. It was at this point that Call of Duty was stepping into the realm of modern wars, with Marines, M16s, and desert battlefields. Now don't get me wrong, there's plenty of explosions and no shortage of over-the-top spectacle, but the game remains grounded throughout this campaign, unlike how future games would end up being with their bombastic stories. And all of that comes to a head with a mission called Shock and Awe. Even the title of the mission is foreshadowing what is to come. And even beyond that, there's loads of foreshadowing. It's actually quite interesting in hindsight how much this mission came to a shock to people. The comms on the helicopter talk about the threat of a nuclear weapon, and just before going down to save the injured pilot, Command says we will not be a safe distance if something were to go off. And yet, despite everything, we still push forward, grab the pilot, and fly away. Because no soldier gets left behind. We are the heroes of the story after all, so surely we will find a way out of this. Seeing the destruction of the blast even today still gives me chills. Whether it's the original or the remastered scene, the background of the mushroom cloud in the distance, the bodies of the other soldiers behind you, the buildings crumbling down, and the echoes of children as you walk by the playground. It gives off a sense of dread that can only be felt while playing a video game. And this is captivated not by what you're able to do as a player, but rather what you're restricted to do. Before this point, the player character has always been moving forward. Weapon in hand, the threat of death always leaning close, but through it all, they have made it through in the end. But this isn't like the last missions, because unlike the others, after about a minute of walking through the aftermath, you die. And there's no historical quote while you wait for a respawn. You just experienced the last moments of a soldier that died a slow and painful death to radiation. It's truly a gut-wrenching scene, and it makes you feel for the soldiers at this point, and not just Jackson. It's moments like this that stick out the most to me in Call of Duty, as they were a way to reach out to the player and show them that they're not always going to win. And it would later influence future games in the series as well. It's interesting looking back at this moment and seeing how iconic it has become, because that's not how the developers saw it. What is this bullshit? Well, I get up, right? They're like, no, you fucking die. Yeah. Like, this is this gameplay, is what is this? I can't win. Yeah. Like, why do I want to play a game I can't win? That the idea wasn't appealing to them, so why would it be appealing to anyone else? And in the original design, your character was supposed to survive. 
But in the end, they decide to have your character perish as it builds on the theme of the game and the idea that the heroics don't always result in victory. And yes, I'm paraphrasing what Racevic said in his video. No, I am not copying him. Don't look at me like that. But this scene is a clear example of how to take a risky move and show a shocking scene that builds on the message and the themes of the game. And it works tremendously. However, this doesn't. So, Infinity Ward took a risk with the nuke scene, showcasing a very real and traumatic event, but it made sense with the context of the story. It's something that I believe the main villain of the game would do, and with the rank and power that Al-Assad had, there's enough logical explanation to believe that he would do something like this. But this... This is purely for shock value. Now, I get what they're going for. They want to show Makarov as an absolute piece of shit that would murder people in his own country just to start a war with the US. And it's not like the subject matter itself is what I don't like, I couldn't care less. It's the amount of plot holes that are within it. Like, how did none of the security cameras recognize Makarov, a known fucking terrorist, or any of his companions? There was another guy that died too, are you telling me they also attributed him as an American? Also, do you really expect me to believe that Russia would go to war, all due to the body of a single US soldier being seen at the scene of the crime? It's little things like this that consistently go through my head whenever I think about this scene. And whatever I do, the only reason I can think for this scene's existence is that they want to make a villain over the top and evil, and someone that was worse than Al-Assad and Zakaev. And this was the best way to do it. Now, you can make the same argument for the nuke scene in Call of Duty 4, but that at least has merit to it. It doesn't stem from plot holes, at least not as many. But this also shows the fundamental differences of both the games as well. Call of Duty 4 was the end of the World War II era of Call of Duty games, at least for now. It showed that the franchise was adaptive and wanted to branch out beyond what we're used to. It created a new story that took risks and implemented realism that was felt in the modern day to invoke a hard-hitting, immature story about the soldiers. And World at War had that same feeling. Even if this game went back to World War II, it had a lot of inspiration from Call of Duty 4, mainly with the more grounded and gritty story. Only this one was even more brutal. World at War is mostly remembered for its unfiltered depiction of the brutality that went on in the Second World War. It paints a gruesome picture on every faction, whether you were playing against them or playing as them. Modern Warfare 2, on the other hand, was when the series decided to go full throttle and delve into the insane and over-the-top spectacle of the campaign story. And the games that came after followed suit. Black Ops was Treyarch's Modern Warfare 2 at that time. It had even more explosions, a high spectacle campaign, and was filled with the most insane batshit you could find. Numbers! What? Are they saying? And it was at this point that the games continued down this road. Now, that's not to say that these games are bad. Black Ops is my personal favorite Call of Duty game. But it's important to see them as the catalyst games for what affects how the general quality of the decisions of the franchise are affected throughout the years. I even called this whole thing the Modern Warfare 2 effect. Basically, take a long-running franchise, movie, game, or whatever. Now think of the one in the series that was generally seen as really good from the community, but harbors a lot of the issues that the franchise keeps as it goes on. To use another example, World of Warcraft Wrath of the Lich King is seen as the best expansion by many. Wherever you go, people will tell you that it was when the game was at its peak. It's when they had the most fun with the game due to the classes and the raids that were added. But when people discuss their issues with modern WoW and the problems that have piled up with the current state of the game, it can usually be trailed back to Wrath of the Lich King. It's something that a lot of media goes through, and it's a tricky thing to break out of. And hell, Call of Duty has been trying to break out of it for a while. They almost did with the Modern Warfare reboot. That game had a really good campaign in multiplayer, but they just weren't able to capitalize after it. And they got so invested in this. Playtime is over when Nikki drops in. The games nowadays don't even replicate what they used to be. It is losing that grasp for the classic players like myself to play the new ones, which is a shame because I do miss the old days of playing some classic Call of Duty with my friends. And it doesn't seem like Activision is willing to deliver anytime soon.